When preachers talk about the last days and Christ's second coming, they usually talk about wars and rumors of wars, about Russia, Iran, Persia, Armageddon, the Antichrist. But realistically, there's very little we can do about those events because the last day's events, the Moad moments of God, are going to happen where and when he wants them to happen. But there are things that we do have control over in these last days, and we can influence the manner and the quality of our life in the Holy Spirit when we choose and make a quality, determined decision to walk in love and forgiveness. The first thing Jesus said in Matthew 24 when he was asked about the signs of the last days, he said, take heed, pay attention to yourself, that no man deceive you. The word planeo literally means don't be led astray. Don't wander off from the right and true path into error. Verse 10, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. The Greek skandalizo literally means they'll be ensnared and caught in a trap of offense and hurt feelings. And that'll turn into betrayal and that'll turn into hatred, missio in the uh, Greek text, which means the type of hatred that causes one to persecute the people that don't agree with them. Then in verse 12, he said, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. The word iniquity is translated from the Greek anomos, which literally means no law. He said, when lawlessness and refusal to acknowledge the true authority, God's authority begins to rule the earth in anarchy and disorder will reign. And when that happens, the agape suko, or as it's spelled in the Greek, agape psycho, your love is going to grow cold. It'll stop being on fire. You'll become lukewarm. But then he gives us hope in verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Hallelujah. The word sozo means you, there is a place in these last days where you can be saved, you can stay healed, you can walk in wholeness, and you can walk in complete deliverance. And what's the key? The voice translation says, those who do not waver from the true path, those who stay in place instead of leaving, quitting, and falling apart. I can't do anything about when the rapture takes place. Pre, mid, post, does me no good to even argue about it. But I can focus on keeping myself on the right path with God and the Holy Spirit in these last days. And I can choose to refuse to be led and tricked into the scandalizo traps of the last days where hurt feelings, being easily offended, and nursing wounded pride becomes the thing that everyone seems to be doing. I can choose to walk in love and not strife, even to the point of learning how to love my enemies in these last days. The message says, message translation says, things are going to go from bad to worse. It'll be dog eat dog, everyone at each other's throat, everyone hating one another. That's what we're entering into. Like a giant net falling over planet Earth, every nation, every tribe, every city, every segment of society is going to become ensnared in a web of resentment, bitterness, and wounded pride. Everyone, that is, except for the ecclesia, the called out ones, the body of Christ that chooses to walk in love and avoid the scandalizo traps of the last days. Jesus said, these offenses lead to betrayal, and betrayal leads to hate. The word hate, missio, is the type of hatred that makes one want to hurt and persecute the people that don't agree with them. Boy, is that a statement of what's going on right now? I looked up the word persecute, and it means to have hostility or ill treatment, especially because of one's ethnicity, one's religion, religious beliefs, one's sexual orientation. It's a modern dictionary I looked up. Or one's political beliefs. I've never lived in a time where people were so opposed to even having an open discussion about these things. 
The Bible says that we are children of the light and we are children of the love. And Ephesians 4 says that we are to be rooted and grounded in love and to know and experience for ourselves the love of Christ so that we can be filled with the fullness of God. So that we can be filled up throughout our whole being, the Amplified says, so that we may have the richest experience of God's presence in our lives. So you've got a choice. You can defend your position to the point of argument and strife and persecution, or you can choose to walk in love. You can be caught up in being offended and, and, and defending your position. You can rail against those that are destroying our country. You can talk about them and gossip about them with your friends. But when you do that, you've got to understand you're walking out of light and you're walking into darkness. And that's where the enemy lives. That's where the scandalizo traps are. The traps waiting for you to have wounded pride and feelings of, 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 of guilt and shame and anger and whatever so that you can be ensnared and caused to wander away from the true path of following God. So what's the remedy? Well, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, forgive, forgive, let it go, let it drop, release it, quit nurturing it. Let it go, lest Satan should get an advantage over you, for you or we are not ignorant of his devices, his noema, his purpose and what he's thinking, what he's trying to do, his plans. He has a plan to entice you, to trip you up, and he knows exactly what triggers you. He is going to send the perfect person across your path, and that person is going to push those buttons it's going to ruin your day unless you've decided to walk in love and not strife. It doesn't work, his plan, when you make the decision that I'm a child of love and not a child of strife. When I've made the quality decision that I am not someone who is easily offended, I am a child of love. And also, I am not ignorant of Satan's devices. Oh, the translation says his plans, his methods, his schemes, his kesharim, his conspiracies, his conspiracy to push your buttons and to get you into offenses and hurt feelings to get you to walk away. But you're not going to walk away because you're a child of love, even in the last days. Nevertheless, when you do blow it, <laughs> and you let down your shoe, because we all do, we're not perfect, you can immediately put into plan the action that the Apostle Paul gave us in Ephesians chapter 4. And he says this, you're going to be angry, but don't fall into sin. Let not the sun go down on your wrath, neither give place to the devil. The Greek topos means don't give him any spot, any space, or any opportunity. How? by carrying your anger or your strife into the next day, in the following week, in the next month. You can't afford to let anger and strife be carried over from one 24-hour period to another. To control your life in these days, you have to immediately to res respond to the weak moments when you yielded yourself, you were baited, you were tricked into anger, strife, resentment, bitterness. Don't continue nursing it and talking about it over and over again. Forgive. Forgive yourself. Forgive the people that wounded you. Let it go. Let it go and receive the balm of forgiveness to heal all the things that have hurt you in life. Tay's translation says it this way. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Let it go. Let it go now. Philip's translation says, never go to bed angry. Don't give the devil that sort of foothold in your life. Voice says, don't give the devil any room to work. Once you realize that you've been ensnared or tripped up and you're behaving in a way that a child of love should not behave, <laughs> don't try and justify your position. Let it go. Forgive. Release it. Right now, not tomorrow, not next week, right now, let it go. You see, it's not a sin to get angry. The Bible says Jesus got angry. 
But anger only becomes harmful and destructive when you nurse it and you continue to feed it until it turns into bitterness, resentment, and thoughts of revenge and punishing the people that hurt you. And that's when you build a stronghold in your life. And that makes it very difficult to forgive, to let it drop. The door is now opened to all kinds of satanic activity. And what did Jesus say the devil's plan is? To steal, to kill, and destroy. To steal your joy, to steal your peace, to kill your hopes and dreams. Literally, the word there in the Greek means to be a sacrifice and to destroy everything about your life and the people around you. You've heard of John 3.16? Well, look at James 3.16. Where there is envying and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. Strife, if allowed to operate and continue, opens the door to every evil work. The Living Bible says, where there is strife, there will be disorder and every kind of evil. The Amplified says, where there is strife, there will be confusion unrest, disharmony, rebellion, all sorts of evil and vile practices because strife opens the door to the kingdom of darkness. That's why 2 Timothy chapter 2 says, the servant of the Lord must not strive. Makomai means to quarrel, to fight, to argue, to debate, to wrangle. It's those who engage in a war of words. Now, a lot of times we justify it because we're trying to defend our position. And we say, we're defending God. We're defending truth, righteousness. Well, God knows how to defend himself. And your type of defense is just going to get you worked up. And that bait has sucked you in and that trap's going to close and it's going to pull you out of light into darkness. The servant of the Lord must not quarrel and fight and argue and debate and engage in a war of words. Because strife opens the door to confusion and every evil work. Could it be that the confusion and the disharmony you are experiencing right now in life could be totally exterminated and wiped out just by you letting go of some hurt or some wounded feeling that you've been carrying for days, weeks, months, maybe years? By asking the Lord to flow through you with his grace and his love and asking him to cleanse you of all wounded pride and all hurt feelings you've been carrying towards fill in the blank. That person that you keep thinking about when you put your head on the pillow, when you're brushing your teeth, when you're driving down the road, that, that conversation you keep going over and you change the verbiage so you come out right, you did the right thing. That's what I'm talking about. That's resentment. That's holding the feelings back. That's not letting go. The Bible says in the last days, offenses are going to multiply. And the only way to go through this victorious, just victoriously is to make the decision to walk in love, to live in love, and to forgive, to let it go quickly. Let me help you make the decision. Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 6. For if you forgive men their trespasses, their paraptoma, their offenses, whether intentional or unintentional, your heavenly Father will forgive you. If you let it go, he'll let it go. Verse 15. But if you forgive not their offenses, neither will your Father forgive you. If you don't let it go, he won't let it go. <laughs> you say, Perry, why did you read that to me? Because <laughs> I'm trying to help you. The Amplified Classic says, if you do not forgive their trespasses, their reckless and willful sins, if you don't learn how to let them go, how to give up resentment once and for all, neither will your father forgive you your trespasses. The message says, you've got to forgive because if you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. Mm, did you hear that? If you refuse to do your part, that is, forgive, let it go, really let it go, then you cut yourself off from God's part. It's not that he won't heal you or forgive you or deliver you. It's that your act of refusing to let it go has put you in a place where it limits what God can and cannot do for you. When you refuse to forgive, you walk out of the light into an isolated lonely and dark place. And that's not good. 
In Matthew 6, Jesus taught the disciples prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, what's God's will? Love be done on earth. Forgiveness be done on earth. Shalom, peace be done on earth as it is in heaven. And forgive us our debts as the same way that we forgive our debtors. In the original Greek text, two adverbs are used here when one could have sufficed. It's written hos kai. Kai means and, uh, and or likewise. But host, the adverb host literally means when, like, and in the same manner as. In other words, Jesus linked the quality and the timing of the forgiveness you receive to the quality and timing of the forgiveness you give to others. When do you give it? How quickly do you give it? Do you hold on to it just long enough to kind of pay them back? Or do you, are you quick to let it go? How do you give it? Like, how do you do it? Do you have to point it out to them? Bless God, I'm going to forgive you no matter what you did. Or do you do it in love and mercy and in the same manner? That's how God is going to forgive you. So let me ask you this question. How soon do you want the Father to forgive you when you sin? <laughs> How gentle do you like him to be when he forgives you because you've sinned? What is the manner you want that forgiveness to be handed to you? <laughs> Glory to God. It's a beautiful thing. Have you ever noticed how forgiveness and healing are linked together? And also unforgiveness and sickness and disease are linked together. In Matthew 9, the Bible says they brought to Jesus a man that was sick of the palsy, the Greek paralyticos. He was a paralytic. He was lying on a bed and he said, son, be of good cheer. Jesus looked at that man who can't move. He's paralyzed. People are having to carry him around. No telling how many long years or months he's been at this place. And he says, be of good cheer. The Greek tharseo literally means be confident, be bold, be courageous. Your sins are forgiven you. He's looking at a paralyzed man in the eyes and he's saying, be bold and be courageous because your sins are now forgiven. Afi they are sent away. I'm letting them go. I'm releasing them right now. The same anointing that empowers forgiveness is the same anointing that will heal your physical body. Did you hear that? Verse five says, when the Pharisees and the hypocrites begin to say that Jesus doesn't have the power to do this, this is blasphemy. Jesus responded and said, well, let me ask you this question. What is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say rise and walk? He's saying the same anointing, the same supernatural energy that you use to forgive is the same anointing and energy that will heal your body and heal the bodies of your loved ones. What is easier to say? Verse six, but that you may know that the son of man has the exousia, the power, the authority on earth to forgive. He said to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up your bed and go to your house. And the man was healed. The authority to forgive is equal to the authority to heal and deliver and set free. The power that's released in forgiveness when you forgive is the same unction and anointing that's released when you pray for people to be healed. The power that is released in one act of true forgiveness contains enough authority to heal and deliver everyone that's in your circle of influence, those that are captive by the devil. Forgiveness and healing, unforgiveness and disease are tied together. Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not, don't mislay all his benefits, who forgiveth all your iniquities and healeth all your diseases. Same power, same anointing. James 5, if there's any sick among you, call for the elders, anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord, and the Lord will raise them up. And if he's committed sins, because some sickness is caused by an open door to sin and disobedience, 
And if he has committed sins, they shall be forgiven. Afi ami, they will be sent away. They'll be released. They will be let go. Forgiveness and healing are linked together. Unforgiveness and sickness are linked together in the name of Jesus. That's why Jesus said in one of his first teachings, the spirit of the Lord is epi is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Now listen to this. He's, he's given me an anointing to Caruso preach forgiveness to the captives because it's the Greek word for forgiveness, release, a setting free and recovering of sight to blind, to the blind and to set at liberty, same word, forgive. To forgive, to release, to release them that are bruised. The anointing of forgiveness heals the wounds of life. The authority and the anointing and power that's released by an act of forgiveness will heal those that are broken and brokenhearted and those that are diseased and cramped. The next time that I talk about this, I'm going to go into detail about this and tell, and tell you and explain to you what that means. But I want to close now with these words. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you've heard it said that you shall love your neighbor and hate, missio, your enemy. But I say unto you, no, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to bless them that curse you and do good to them that hate you and pray for them which despitefully usually use you. He said, those that are speaking bad words about you, that are gossiping about you, don't gossip about them. You logii, speak good words about them. Those that are despitefully using you, pray for them. Enter into intercession for them. Speak good words and help them be delivered by the power of forgiveness. Forgive them even if they haven't asked you to. Verse 45. Forgive so that you may be children of your father, children of love, which is in heaven. For he makes the sun to rise and on the evil and on the good. To he sends rain on the just and the unjust. Be therefore perfect, teleos, complete, lacking nothing, finished, developed, full grown, even as your father, which in heaven is perfect. The Amplified says, therefore you will be perfect. You will grow into spiritual maturity, both in mind and in character, as you actively integrate godly values, love, forgiveness into your daily life. The message says, live out your God created identity, live generously and graciously towards others the way God lives towards you. Be generous in handing out forgiveness. Be generous in handing out mercy. The voice translation says, because you are called to a higher calling. You are called to something higher. You are called to be a display of God's love to the world. The message says, I'm telling you, love your enemies. Let them bring out the best in you <laughs> and not the worst. When someone gives you a hard time, respond with supple moves of prayer. For then you are working out your true self, your God-created self. This is what God does. He gives his best, the sun to warm, the rain to nourish to everyone, regardless of who they are, the good and the bad, the nice and the nasty. Now is the time to be nice to the nasty. When judgment comes, God will deal with the nasty. But we are the ecclesia, the called out ones, the church. We've been called. We've been summoned out of the world to walk in his light, out of the world that's falling apart, to walk in his glory, to walk in his love. It's time for us to stand up and to be children of love, children that are not offended, that don't walk in anger, that don't walk in strife, that are displays of the love and glory of God to their circle of influence.